Welcome to the Word on Woodward. I'm your host, Daniela Bruce, alongside my co-host, Art Regner, and joining us today, Tigers writer for MLB.com, Jason Beck. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's been a while since we caught up, and boy, do we have some Tigers news to talk about today. Yeah, it's been a busy offseason, that's for sure, especially you know, between Eduardo Rodriguez and the trade for Tucker Barnhart. Well, let's start right there with Eduardo Rodriguez. The Tigers obviously bringing in a veteran arm, which we expected them to do. What type of pitcher do you anticipate the Tigers are getting in Rodriguez? Well, they're getting a guy that they feel like can handle some innings for them, can can really be a workhorse in rotation, but also has some upside. Um, you know, I know people look at the, uh, the ERA a little bit from last year and feel like it might have been elevated, but if you look at the underlying metrics behind the pitches, there's reason to believe that he was bet a better pitcher than the base numbers would have indicated, which is why he had a decent amount of interest on the market. Um, you know, he had some good deception on the pitches, some good movement. Um, he, to some degree, was a victim of uh, balls put in play, but at the same time, he didn't give up a uh, high exit velocity. He's not necessarily a hard contact guy. He's a guy who can get swings and misses at times, although not necessarily a big time strikeout pitcher. And he's a guy who can get soft contact and ground ball out. Uh, Jason, I I thought during Eduardo's presser yesterday, he sort of said something almost underneath underneath his breath, kind of, you know, in, in passing, where he talked about how he thought the size of Comerica Park would really help his numbers when his ERA was brought up. And he kind of was smirking. But do we have a tendency to, to forget, if you're a pitcher, there aren't many ballparks better than Comerica Park for you to pitch in? Yeah, that's the irony about, you know, it, being a pitcher who can get ground ball outs effectively. Is this the good place that if you have fly ball tendencies, this is not a bad place to pitch? Now, sometimes that gets tested. You know, Matthew Boyd, yet led the league in uh, home runs allowed in back-to-back seasons. So, you know, there are limits to that. You, know, you still have to, you know, you can't give up too much hard contact on, on fly balls. But, you know, this is a place that's very forgiving if you feel like you have a pitch that, you know, maybe you, you didn't quite hit, hit your location on it, but maybe a guy gets under. You, you generally have to really center a ball to get it out between the gaps, you know, be, between the gaps and, and through center field. So it's not a uh, easy place for uh, cheap home runs, you know, certainly once you get beyond the lines. Jason, let's move on to talking about the trade for catcher Tucker Barnhart. So we bring in Barnhart, another veteran catcher, and hopefully he'll pair up really nicely working with Eric Haas as well. But we got to talk to him on the Word on Woodward a couple of weeks ago, and he seemed the most excited about working with some of our young pitchers like Casey Mize and Tarek Skubal. Is that the biggest positive about acquiring Barnhart and what he can do as a catcher? Yeah, yeah, the game, the the. The, uh, the game plan for him, the scouting reports, is that he's a good game caller, a good pitch caller. He gets mm-hmm. pitchers on board with how he's calling a game. He's able to observe, you know, hitters' tendencies that go beyond the scouting report and go more into the uh, into the micro level on it as far as, like, game to game, at bat to at bat. Um, you know, and, and that's helpful for a young pitcher. It gives him a little bit less to worry about. But also, he's, he, had, he has had good pitch framing metrics in his career and is a guy who can get calls on the corner. Now, how much, how long we have to worry about that um, into the future, we'll see. But certainly for, for the short term, you know, pitch framing is still a, a big quality to look for in big league catchers. And this guy has a track record of it. it it's been a little bit up and down, this pitch framing metrics tend to be, but more often than not, he's been quality on that. And, you know, when you're trying to get guys to pitch to the corners and maybe, you know, try to be precise on the locations, that makes a difference. Jason, I, I, you know, again, and I'm not so much going back to Eduardo Rodriguez here, but I wanted to ask you something about, it, it really seemed that Miguel Cabrera was really prevalent in, in has been recruiting I don't know if it's just Eduardo or all the uh, the players the Tigers want to acquire, but again, 
he's not the Miguel Cabrera that we remember winning triple crowns and he's kind of struggled at the plate and ha- is working through some injuries yet when he was going for his quest for 500 and 3000 hits I think it kind of renewed maybe here in Detroit just what a great ball player he truly is and what influence he does have in Major League Baseball how much of an asset is is an aging Miguel Cabrera to this Tigers organization. Well, I mean, let's face it. He's still the face of this franchise. Um, and he's going to be as long as he's around, I would think. Um, you know, it's, you know, yes, he, he's not the hitter he once was, but you have this guy coming up on accomplishments that less than three dozen players in history have done in terms of the, the 500 home runs. and. You know, he's going to get 3,000 hits at some point early this next season. Um, you know, that's a huge club. You know, I, I mean, that's a huge milestone historically. And it's, it's a very exclusive club to be in both of those categories. And, you know, you have that guy right here right now, a guy who, you know, a lot of other major league players, especially young guys, you know, have the, the utmost respect for a guy that, in some young players' cases, you know, they, they grew up watching. You know, they grew up watching this guy win that that triple crown in 2012. Uh, you know, that's that makes a big difference. And to have him be able to put in a good word for the Tigers to Eduardo Rodriguez, you know, even Rodriguez said, you know, that makes a difference. You know, he he considers him a close friend and for him to be able to explain the you know, the fabric of Detroit and what baseball means here to, to Rodriguez really, I I got the impression that meant as much, if not more, than the recruiting visit that, that Al Avila and A.J. Hinch made down to Miami to, to talk to Rodriguez and his agent about what what they're trying to do up here. Well, Jason, we better hope then that Miguel Cabrera puts his recruiting cap back on because we can almost guarantee that the Tigers are going to make at least one more move um, in this offseason, especially at that shortstop position. Obviously, the Correa rumors are flying all over the place. We know that A.J. Hinch had lunch with him. But let me ask you this, Jason. What other moves do you think the Tigers are going to make? We know that we see a shortstop in the future somewhere, but what else do you think they're going to add in this offseason? Well, beyond the shortstop, I, you know, they are looking for one more starting pitcher. You know, they, they'd mm-hmm. like to be able to round that out that rotation with somebody proven. Um, you know, is it going to be on the level of, of of the addition like Rodriguez? You know, we'll see. I think they're, you know, we're still waiting to see if it's worth waiting for the market to sort out and see who's left or if the starting pitching market is going to move so quickly that, you know, maybe they even add a second starter before they add a shortstop. You know, even, you know, even as we get near Thanksgiving, you know, the, the starting pitching market is still moving. You know, we're, we're reading, you know, Stephen Matz could sign soon. We're reading about, you know, these, these other guys. Uh, you know, Alex Wood appears to be uh, nearing a deal, if not at a deal with, with the Giants. The Giants seem to be moving cr- pretty aggressively to refill their rotation. So that could go. Um, there's a possibility that the Tigers could add an outfielder, even though, as Al said uh, at the end of the season, you know, the outfield is pretty crowded already in Detroit, and it's going to get more crowded when Riley Green is fighting for a uh, spot on the opening day roster. So it's, but as they look for ways to upgrade their offense, I think that's one of the ways they see where. You know, especially if there are some guys lingering on the market as we get closer to the spring training, that might be a place where the Tigers can get opportunistic and try to find a guy on, you know, maybe a short term deal to give them a little bit more veteran bat while Green matures, while Akil Badu matures, and while Derek Hill and uh, Daz Cameron, you know, kind of fight for, for their spots. Jason, you know, yesterday in yesterday's press conference, and we're doing this on uh, Tuesday, uh, talking to Jason in our little hot stove here conversation, uh, the labor impasse is, was brought up. And last week, the commissioners, uh, baseball commissioner said that, uh, you know, we're going to lock them out. Uh, and, yeah, you know, that, that might happen soon. How much of an impact is that going to have as far as contracts? Is Eduardo Rodriguez maybe the last big contract we're going to see until this labor situation is, uh, is, um, you know, um, negotiated and we're back to playing baseball. 
Well, for, from what Al was saying uh, on Monday, you know, he they're proceeding business as usual. Um, you know, they're they're going after guys, um, you know, pretty much the same way as it would a normal offseason. I think the one difference is this this market seems to be moving quicker. Now you can get into mm-hmm. all the reasons why. Um, you know, and maybe you are seeing guys who are trying to, you know, get their deals sewn up and teams that are trying to solve what they can while while there's still certainty in the market and, and maybe trying to get things out of the way just in case you end up in a situation where that window closes and maybe it doesn't open again, you know, for a little bit and maybe you have a short, another shortened window uh, before spring training. We'll, we'll see, um, you know, who knows. But it's... Uh, you know, right now, it looks like certain segments of the mar- market are moving pretty aggressively, and uh, starting pitching seems to be one of them. Uh, surprisingly, more so than maybe shortstops, where you know that group of top shortstops really is, you know, arguably that the top free agents on the market in general, regardless of position. Um, last question from me, Jason. I just wanted to get your thoughts on Cody Clemens real quick. We know that the Tigers did protect him from the upcoming Rule 5 draft. Just what do you think that means for his development and what we're going to see out of him next season? I think that's big. I, I think that's huge, actually, uh, You know, because I think you know some of us were surprised when he did not get a call-up at all uh, this past season, um, even when there was a need for some infield help. And and some left-handed hitting. You know, they, they let him stay down there to work on his offense and, and work on spreading out his uh, positional resume in Toledo. And, you know, it kind of made you wonder, you know, are they going to carry this guy or are they going to leave him exposed to the Rule 5 draft? And for frankly, for a guy with his versatility, um, I would have expected that had he not been added to the roster, he probably would have been a prime candidate to, to get drafted. Good move by the Tigers. I have a few more questions for you, but uh, they're not. Uh, Daniela, hang on. Um, first of all, Spencer Torkelson is at first base. It's a position of need. So I'm going to ask you this. Spencer Torkelson and is Riley Green so far ahead of the curve right now, the developmental curve, Will both of those prized, uh, and I'm going to call them rookies, will those both of those prized rookies be on the opening day roster to begin the 2022 season? Um, you know what? I think they have a real shot. Uh, you know, maybe part of it depends on what we're looking at as far as like the the uh, the new rules under the collective bargaining agreement. I, I don't know, but you know, I think yeah, you know, this is a team that has a history that if you fight for a spot and you show you're clearly one of the top options in camp that they're willing to carry. You know, this is a team where, you know, if they sense the right spot and the right opportunities, they're willing to do it. You know, I've been thinking about this and Danielle, I would like you to comment on this too. Have the Tigers put themselves in a damned if they do and damned if they don't position by basically saying we're going to have an open checkbook this year or we're going to spend money. So based on that, like depending on who they sign, like, oh, man, they they didn't, you know, hit the home run, so to speak, in the shortstop position or, whoa, they gave, you know, him way too much. So, you know, I mean, no matter what they do, I think they're going to they've opened themselves up to criticism. With that said, I'm asking you and Danielle, again, if you would like to be part of this, more, you're more than welcome because uh, it's really essentially your show. Trust me, Jason. She the edge calls the shots. Um, but with that said, um, who is the starting shortstop for the Detroit Tigers opening day 2022? Who is there picking up those ground balls and throwing them to Spencer Torkelson or Jonathan Scope if it's a double play? Oh, boy. Um, I, I think... They're going to get a shortstop. I don't know if they're going to get the shortstop. Um, for the sake of this question, yeah, I'll, I'll throw Correa out there because uh, right. if anything, we're at this point in the off season, and right now, while there are a lot of potential destinations for Correa, you know, I don't see one that has stepped up and been more logical than Detroit. You know, especially when 
you read about the Yankees kind of laying low and laying back and waiting for the shortstop market to play out. You know, that New York has been the big concern as far as what, you know, who could come out here and really be aggressive and snag a guy like Correa. And if the Yankees are going to play more passively and wait to see who lingers out there on the market, you know, not everybody's going to be able to do this. Not everybody who is supposedly sitting back and waiting for the market to play out is going to be able to do that. At some point, somebody has to make a move. And, you know, the Tigers have the clearest needed shortstop. You know, it, it certainly would play into them eventually making the move. And, and if assuming Correa is still available, then, you know, then they move to get Correa um, under some sort of terms. You know, maybe it ends up being like how Manny Machado ended up in San Diego to where we don't hear anything until very late in the off season, maybe around spring training, maybe there's a waiting game here, but you know, right now that's, while it's one of many possibilities, it seems to be the, the most logical at this point until we see somebody start to move on the market and somebody to, to set the tone here. Well, you know, uh, Daniela uh, has been saying Correa forever. I mean, that, I know that's. I actually guy, have so. been, but I'm not. That's not like a hot take or anything. I think everybody has been saying Correa forever. Well, um, I would say I, that I, Alavila's I, comments, though. I, granted, I don't think a general manager is ever going to get up on the podium and completely show his hand and say we're going to spend this much money and we're not going to spend this much money and all of that. But he did say it has to be strategic that one player isn't going to make this Tigers team, which he's right about. So I don't know. His comments were, uh, we'll see. But I, yes, I am very much on the Korea train. And we appreciate all of your insight. And hopefully we have some more Tigers news to talk about soon. Again, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Great to see you guys again. And this has been another edition of The Word on Woodward. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And we'll see you next time.